Well, most of us probably know what I'm about to say to you, but I'll say it in case you don't know all of this. Veronica Mary Rolfe is an independent scholar, university lecturer, and in addition to more recent books, Veronica is the author of two influential books that you can see at her elbow when she speaks with us, An Explorer's Guide to Julian of Norwich, 2018, the IVP Reader's Choice Award it got, and also Julian's Gospel, Illuminating the Life and Revelations of Julian, which won a number of prizes, including the first place Catholic Media Association Book Award. After growing up fascinatingly in the world of the professional theatre, lecturing on theatre arts, having her plays produced on stage and TV, being an artistic director of a multiracial performing arts company and training professional actors, Veronica changed direction a little more recently mm -hmm. and has become the most significant presence promoting Julian of Norwich online in the world, I'm going to say. Um, her Facebook reach is huge. Her podcast series on Julian that began during lockdown and broadening more recently to biblical mystics and the mystical path have blessed people very widely. And her retreat ministry, including online, is rich and growing. I'm going to stop there, although I could go on because we want to hear from Veronica, not about her. But I can't tell you how pleased we are at the Friends of Julian to have Veronica help us celebrate Julian's special 650th anniversary. Oh, thank you, Howard. Thank you. I am so honored and delighted to be part of this glorious 650th anniversary of Julian's Revelations, even though I'm in California and, 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 and all of us are all over the world. Uh, we're one and uh, we're one in our love of Julian and our longing to know and love her more. Uh, so today I want to examine the words so closely associated with Julian, all shall be well and all shall be well. And thou shalt see thyself that all manner of thing shall be well. So I will speak for about an hour and a quarter. I won't rush. And then we'll have a question and answer time and any comments you, you care to make. And then I'll finish with some final words and Julian's own prayer. So to begin with, I want to delve into the context of these profound words that Julian heard Christ speak to her. And this was in response to her own lifelong questioning, because from her youth, Julian tells us that she had desired a bodily sight that is of Christ on the cross, wherein she says, I might have a greater understanding of the bodily pains of our savior and of the compassion of Our Lady and of all his two lovers that were living at that time and saw his pains. For I would have been one of them and have suffered with them. So Julian was convinced that if she had such a bodily vision, she would have a truer understanding of and a sympathy with all that the Lord suffered for our sake. And this was the mind of the passion that she wanted. She wanted to undergo some measure of what Mary Magdalene and the other true lovers, mostly women, saw, heard, and felt at the crucifixion. And this extraordinary request was granted to Julian when she was 30 and a half years old. She had suffered for a week, very, very sick, with an illness and a paralysis that she thought she was going to die of. And a priest came and put a crucifix at the end of her bed and told her to lift her eyes to the crucifix. And she did. And suddenly she saw Christ bleeding on the cross. His sufferings would continue for the next 11 hours, but also she would see Christ glorified, transformed, exultant, joyous, on the cross. So that was an intimation, of course, of the resurrection. And through those 
first 11 hours and then another hour the next night, Christ showed Julian 16 revelations of divine love. And throughout these showings or revelations, Julian continued to ponder the reality of sin that had caused so much suffering to Christ and that causes so much suffering for all of us. She was desperate to know how God sees us in our sinfulness. Are we to be considered sinners and blameworthy and therefore justly to be punished by the so-called wrath of God? Or is God not wrathful at all? Which was one of the revelations Julian saw and heard and felt, but unconditionally loving. And therefore, are our sins not done away with by the death and passion of Jesus Christ? In other words, Julian wanted secareness. That was her favorite word, secare, means certainty, sureness, confidence. She wanted secareness. Are we truly saved? Now, in the 13th revelation, Julian writes, and after this, our Lord brought to mind the longing that I had for him before. And I saw that nothing prevented me but sin. And so I beheld this generally in us all. And it seemed to me, if sin had not been, we should all have been as clean and like to our Lord as he made us. And thus in my folly before this time, often I wondered why, by the great foreseeing wisdom of God, the beginning of sin was not prevented. For then I thought that all would have been well. So here, Julian recalls that youthful longing for the mind of the passion and the longing to be united with Christ. And she realizes that the only thing that prevents her or us is sin. And she confesses quite candidly that she'd often thought that everything would have been well, would have been wonderful if only God had not allowed sin. And she continues, this stirring was much to be rejected, but nevertheless, I mourned and sorrowed over it, lacking reason and discretion. But Jesus, who in this vision informed me of all that I needed, answered by this word and said, sin is behovely. But all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So here, in the 13th revelation, is the first time we hear this famous quotation so associated with Julian. But usually, you only hear the all shall be well part, not the sin is behovely part that precedes it. And Christ's words seem to have been prompted by Julian's own suggestion that all would have been well if there had been no sin. But Christ does not agree with her reasoning. He tells Julian that sin is behovely, but all shall be well. That is, all shall be well in spite of sin. Now, behovely in Middle English bears those connotations of useful necessary, even, even advantageous. And the startling meanings as applied to sin can only bring to mind the ancient exalted, the hymn of praise we sing before the Paschal candle at the Easter vigil, which describes the sin of Adam as, oh, happy fault, oh, necessary sin of Adam, which has gained for us so great a redeemer. Could the concept of sin as the gravest affront to God and the curse of humanity become so transformed through the suffering and death of Christ that sin might really be deemed useful, necessary, even at times advantageous? St. Paul wrote that we know all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And St. Augustine taught that God can bring good even out of evil. Now, this is because of Christ's perfect sacrifice, 
that triumphed over sin and death. But Julian is not satisfied. She simply doesn't understand what Christ is telling her. How could sin be behovely, useful, necessary, even advantageous in some cases? She had long endured the terrible sting of sin and its results. She'd seen its all pervasive damage all around her. She knew the violence, the brutality of the ongoing hundred years war that lasted during her whole lifetime. She saw the inordinate power and wealth of a few titled aristocrats while the indentured serfs suffered terribly. And she observed the grave misdeeds of those in powerful positions in the church. And all the while the church taught that those who died suddenly and unrepentant in mortal sin would go straight to hell. So Julian simply cannot understand how all could be well if even one person is damned. And I think it's important that we realize that Julian's mental anguish is not just some excessive medieval preoccupation with sin. It's all of humanity's sense of our lives being terribly broken, and we don't know how to fix them. We're quite helpless to save ourselves on our own. And Julian understood that all the catastrophes that were occurring in her lifetime were the result of the grave misdeeds of human beings toward one another, which in turn caused violent upheavals in nature. And she was well aware of the ecological effects of Christ's death on the cross. And as we know only too well, the evil of sin perpetuates every form of anger, addiction, abuse visited on the young and the strong and on infants and the aged and on the infirm and on the weak. Sin destroys families and disrupts governments. And you see now sets one nation against others in deadly wars and sin casts down whole empires. It penetrates to every level of our physical environment. It infects every aspect of our daily lives. And Julian reveals that she suddenly saw the history of the world in a touch. And she said it was readily passed over into comfort. However, she could not see sin because she believed, quote, it hath no manner of substance, nor no part of being, nor may it be known except by the pain that it causes. And it is precisely this pain that eventually forces us to plead for mercy and be purged of our sinfulness. And all the while, Julian writes, our Lord comforts us, saying, it is true that sin is the cause of all this pain, but all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. These words were shown full tenderly, showing no manner of blame to me nor to none that shall be saved. Then it would be a great unkindness of me to blame or wonder at God for my sin, since he blames me not for sin. And with these words, Julian intuited a high and a marvelous secret hidden in God. She understood it will reveal why God allowed sin to come into the world. And she declares it's a sight in which we shall have endless joy. And she affirms that all the sufferings that we endure because of sin, both personally and collectively, great as they may be, they are only for a time in the eternal scheme of things. And in that time, our suffering and our sorrow and our shame for sin humble and purify us, teach us our flaws and our weaknesses. And yes, they bring us to our knees in search of God's mercy. And as such, Julian began to understand that sin can be beholdly, 
useful, necessary, even fitting and good, as Christ had said. It can, by a kind of a, a miraculous alchemy, have a positive outcome. And then, again, this is because of Christ's own transforming sacrifice on the cross. According to Julian, this transformation of sin and decay into glory is possible only because the passion of Christ strengthens us to endure the effects of sin. And Julian comments that it is precisely Christ's blessed will that his passion should do so. She writes, thus I saw how Christ has compassion on us because of sin. And just as before in the passion of Christ, I was filled with pain and compassion. So in this, I was in part filled with compassion for all my even Christians, that is her fellow Christians. And this realization opens Julian out to a greater understanding of how we all, all suffer the effects of sin. And she said, and then I saw that each natural compassion that a person hath for his even Christian with love, it is Christ in him. And furthermore, Julian affirms that Christ wants us to know that because of his passion, all our sufferings will be turned into honors. And the great prophet of our souls, just like the saints, many of whom were once grave sinners. We never suffer alone because Christ in his great courtesy, as Julian says, takes away all our blame and beholds us with compassion and pity as children, innocent and not loathsome. However, even after all these reassuring insights, which Julian documented so beautifully and personally, like a personal diary from herself to us, Julian didn't still understand how all might be well. And she wasn't afraid to ask the Lord questions. She writes, but in this I stood my ground, contemplating generally, anxiously and mournfully, saying thus to our Lord in my meaning with the greatest dread, ah, good Lord, how might all be well for the great harm that is come by sin to thy creatures? And here I desired as far as I dared to have some more open declaring, that is more teaching that wasn't of a private nature, wherewith I might be eased with this. And Christ was not in the least offended by Julian's persistent questioning. He welcomed it with a loving expression. He answered her, Adam's sin was the most harm that ever was done or ever shall be done to the world's end. That is, whatever the first sin that was committed by a human being, wherever and however it happened, it was the most devastating act of disobedience toward the creator. It drove a wedge between the union of God and creation. Yet Christ still didn't want Julian to focus on that or any other subsequent sins. He wanted her to behold his own glorious atonement. The Lord urges all of us to take heed of this. Julian writes, that he said, for since I've made well the greatest harm, then it is my will that thou know thereby that I shall make well all that is less. And Christ's reparation on the cross was so much more pleasing to God than Adam's sin was ever harmful. And the Savior raised humanity to a nobility so much higher than it had before, that the two acts, Adam's sin and Christ's atonement, or our sin and Christ's atonement, cannot be compared. Christ wants this teaching completely understood and devoutly taken into account in every situation. 
if he has made well the greatest harm ever done to human nature, then he can and will make well every other lesser harm done, every mortal sin ever committed. No sin is too great or too small to be made well by Christ's redemptive power. In essence, Christ's mercy is greater than any sin. Julian writes, and thus our good Lord answered to all the questions and doubts that I might make, saying very comfortingly, I may make all thing well, and I can make all thing well, and I will make all thing well, and I shall make all thing well. And thou shalt see thyself that all manner of thing shall be well. So in spite of all the questions and doubts that arose in her mind, the Lord took pity on Julian and yet again gave her this, this, this extraordinary promise of his unfailing power. It, it, it escalates into a, a crescendo, doesn't it? It's like, a, like a, a symphony, as if answering each objection as it arises in Julian's heart. Christ tells her five ways in which he makes all things well. For Julian, these are very clear and concise, and each, each is layered with a, a deeper meaning. Since the Middle English well was a form of wheel, it meant not only well in our modern sense, but it meant the greatest happiness and prosperity, hence well-being. First, Christ may make all things well because he is supreme power. He is able to do all that needs to be done. Second, he can. And that's from the Middle English can, C-A-double-N, like canny, being canny, meaning he knows the best way to do it because he is divine wisdom. And he understands how to perfect his own creation. And third, he will, in the sense that he chooses to do so, since the Father's will will be done. And fourth, he shall. And in Middle English, shall is an even stronger auxiliary verb than will. And this word expresses Christ's absolute intention to make everything well. And fifth, most tenderly, Christ promises Julian in no uncertain terms that she shall see herself that this shall be done. And Julian explicates further, she says, by I may, she understood the working of the Father, and by I can, that of the Son, and by I will, that of the Holy Ghost, and by I shall, the unity of the Blessed Trinity, three persons and one truth. And in the saying, thou shalt see thyself, Julian understood not only herself, but the oneing of all humankind that shall be saved into the blessed Trinity. So in these five words, may, can, will, shall, and shall see, Julian writes, God will be enclosed in rest and peace. When Christ's own spiritual thirst for souls is finally quenched. Indeed, Julian is implying that it is through our blind faith that is sometimes very costly. But through that blind faith, faith that Christ will make all things well, that is how Christ becomes enclosed in the rest and peace of our own hearts. This is where he longs to dwell. She writes, therefore, this is his thirst, a love longing to have us all together, whole in him to his endless bliss as to my sight. For we are not now as fully whole in him as we shall be then. So Julian experiences Christ's spiritual thirst as this eternal love longing, like that of a human parent 
who wants to have the whole family gathered together, safe and happy, never to be parted again, home forever. Christ aches to have all his children made whole and one within himself, enjoying endless bliss. And until such time as we're brought up to heaven and united with Christ, we will never be completely whole. Moreover, until we are fully united to him, Christ's own love longing will not be satisfied. Julian further acknowledges that God is continually making well, not only the noblest and the greatest things, but also the least little things. Nothing will be forgotten. Now, the big question is, are these five words of Christ a statement of fact about what has been fulfilled? Or is it a prophecy concerning what will be accomplished at the end of the world? Both. In God's sight, salvation is already accomplished. It is finished, were Christ's last words on the cross before he bowed his head and handed on his spirit. With his perfect sacrifice, Christ has already overcome every demon, every demon including our own particular demons. And evil is fully routed. In the mind of God, all has already been made well. But from our side, these words are prophecy, full of promise and hope, but not yet fulfilled for each one of us. And why? Because we're still mired in our ignorance and our blindness what Julian calls so graphically our contrariousness. We cannot possibly behold the way God beholds or nor imagine how God could make things well that are obviously not well to our way of seeing right now. We will not be able to envision how he converts evil into good as long as we ourselves are bound by our ignorant views our sinful habits, and our grasping to a false and separate self. Christ is speaking to Julian of the ultimate all shall be well, not the temporary one. Christ did not promise all manner of things shall be well tomorrow, or the next day, or the next year, or at any time during the course of our lives. And Julian certainly did not imply immediate solutions to life's problems when she recorded Christ's words for posterity. I think to interpret Christ's words as meaning he will fix everything exactly to our liking and mend our broken relationships and land us the perfect job and heal all our aches and pains and end all the world conflicts exactly how we wish they would end, and even dispense justice the way we think it should be dispensed. To interpret Christ's words that way is to misunderstand the meaning of the revelation. And unfortunately, the words all shall be well have become so overused that they've lost much of their startling and apocalyptic meaning. This sort of greeting card sentimentality that has grown up around them, that reduces them to some kind of instant panacea for everything that's currently wrong in our lives, is an erroneous interpretation. That final metamorphosis will not, cannot be fully experienced by us here and now. As I said, we simply do not yet have the minds to see how all shall be well, because we're in the process of becoming perfected, purified, transformed. We must still carry our cross every single day. We still can't envision what lies ahead for our loved ones or ourselves, but we cling to our faith that Christ will be with us in every step. And every breath of our life, helping us to make good decisions and to bear our crosses. And we hope with a joyous hope 
that we will feel his strength and grace as he works in small ways and large to transform all our struggles and our sufferings into his own perfect joy. So we wait to see, trusting, yet not knowing how the transformation of all things into good will be accomplished. St. Paul reminds us, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet, at the same time, if we take these words of our Lord to Julian as a prayerful mantra, and we say them to ourselves in prayer during times of worry or crisis or doubt, they will soon come to embody our act of faith in the Lord's working, our immense trust that will, in fact, enable us to see better in the darkness. And if we reassure one another with great compassion and sincerity that all shall be well, with a deep understanding of the meaning of these words, and if we say them with an absolute conviction that the Lord is at work in every situation, whether we understand it or not, and then we'll be able to enable others to experience the power of these words. And then if in the silence of our meditative prayer, we become aware of all our thoughts, and of the convoluted feelings that we attach to those thoughts and the memories and the anticipations and the regrets and the, the whole gamut of feelings, our conflicts and our fears. And if we become aware of them and we let them go, then we begin to see that these concerns and crises can be seen from a divine perspective, from Christ's own point of view within us, from his vantage point, his divine awareness within our hearts. And then when we see from Christ's point of view, we gain an entirely different perspective. We become graced to realize that nothing is as it appears. And no tragedy is forever. And that will help us believe more firmly in the divine process of transformation. Even transfiguration that is always happening at every level of our being. And thus we may begin to live in the divine dimension even now through our faith, through our hope, and through our practice of contemplative prayer that helps us put on the mind of Christ. And ultimately, of course, the only way that all manner of thing can possibly be made well will be through our total transformation through our death and our rebirth into Christ. And only when our minds and hearts are illuminated within a state of perfect knowing and perfect loving, that is when we enter into the beatific vision, then will we be able to comprehend what truly is in the light of God. And then and only then on a completely glorified plane of existence, shall we see ourselves that all manner of things shall be well. Now, I think the key to Julian's ongoing explanation is that the Lord was showing her two separate realities. The one, the human reality, we experience mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, every single day with its joys and its sufferings and its blessings and its curses. This reality is in constant flux. It's ever changing moment to moment for good or for ill. Therefore, it's always fraught with uncertainty, with doubt, with fear, with the pain of dissolution and even loss. 
nothing lasts. In this reality, we think and we feel and we make countless choices, some right, some wrong. And we try very hard to create safe havens of light and peace and love. But at the same time, we are tossed about by conflicts, uncertainties, and all of these over which we have no control. And this is what we call our life. But it's only one way of existing. This earthly life is not the whole of reality. And it is continually darkened by our deep ignorance about the other, the divine reality. Divine reality is God's own life in Trinitarian bliss. And when we are are wrenched away from what we call our life and resurrected as members of Christ's own mystical body. Our minds will become illuminated through and through with this Trinitarian life. We'll be able to see and experience the ever new creation as it pours forth from the word of God in perfect wisdom and love. And then it will be made clear that what we cannot fathom now, how the resurrection, Christ's resurrection and our resurrection to come in Christ has changed everything. And then we will truly have the mind of Christ and be able to see that all manner of things shall be well. And this alone is eternal happiness to rest in contemplation of the central mystery of the Trinity. And again, in the meantime, we live by faith. And faith alone enables us to believe that this, what's happening right now, even this illness or accident or failure or tragedy will be transformed by Christ. As Julian writes, for above the faith is no goodness preserved in this life as to my sight. And beneath the faith, there is no health of soul. But in the faith, there our Lord wills we keep ourselves. For we must by his goodness and his own working, keep ourselves in the faith. And by his sufferance of spiritual adversaries, we are tested in the faith and made strong. For if our faith had no enemies, it should deserve no reward by the understanding that I have of our Lord's meaning. So through the faith, we see that even now divine reality is impinging constantly on human reality through an outpouring of grace. It's like shafts of sunlight that come through a canopy of trees in a dark forest, the dark forest of our mind. But even now, we can begin to live resurrected lives through this faith in Christ's promise and in hope of our salvation and in the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. During her revelations, and in the years to come of contemplation in her anchorage, Julian contemplated this divine dimension and gained profound insights into its nature. And she had a great hope and a revelation that Christ's overpowering and all forgiving love would somehow make all non-believers and sinners, even those who had died in grave sin, completely well. She was even given the promise of a great deed that would be accomplished at the end of time, though she was not given insight as to what that would be. She believed, though, that it was God's will, quote, that we have great regard for all the deeds that Christ has done already and in such profusion, because then we know, trust, and believe all that he shall do. 
And near the end of her revelations, Julian marveled that we're able to believe and continue to hope precisely because of the gift of our faith. She writes, our faith is a light naturally coming from our endless day that is our Father God, in which light our Mother, Christ, and our good Lord, the Holy Ghost, lead us in this mortal life. And at the end of woe, suddenly our eyes shall be opened, and in clearness of sight, our light shall be full. Which light is God, our Maker, Father, and Holy Ghost, in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Thus I saw and understood that our faith is our light in our night, which light is God, our endless day. So for Julian, the deep source of both our faith and our light is none other than divine love that pours itself out in the exact measure that we need and that we can bear to receive at any given moment. And Julian calls this, this spiritual fountain, this, this source, charity. And that charity keeps us firm in our faith and in our hope. And the faith and the hope lead to ever greater charity. And this charity is never a selfish love, which would only seek its own good. On the contrary, charity loves God and loves itself in God and loves all that God loves solely for the sake of God. And Julian reflected that in spite of our simplicity and our contrariousness, and our ignorance, and our blindness, our courteous Lord constantly beholds us and enjoys doing his will in us. He is pleased with us. And she counsels us again and again that the thing that pleases Christ Jesus most is precisely to believe that he enjoys working out our salvation and to rejoice with him and in him. And she attests that in the same way, we shall truly be in the bliss of God in heaven, thanking and praising God. Likewise, quote, in the foresight of God, have we always been loved and known in his endless purpose from without beginning, in which eternal love he created us. In other words, God sees us now as we shall be then, already resurrected sons and daughters. And moreover, when the final judgment is given, we shall discover in God the hidden reason for every single thing that has happened in our lives and how truly we have been loved even when we felt most unlovable. And finally, we will come to understand how Christ has saved us. And then she writes, and then shall none of us be moved to say in anything, Lord, if it had been thus, it would have been well. But we shall say with one voice, Lord, blessed may thou be, because it is thus, it is well. And now we see truly that everything is done as it was thine ordinance to do before anything was made. I just want to touch on the 14th revelation now because at the very beginning, Julian reveals what Christ taught to her about prayer. 
And I believe that these teachings are key to our understanding of how the Lord makes all things well for each one of us, dynamically, existentially. Julian understood that there are two essential aspects of prayer. The first is the right attitude, praying only for what is God's will and to his greater worship, as we say in the Our Father, thy will be done. And the second essential aspect for Julian, as she receives it from the Lord, is secure, there's that word again, secure, confident trust. And Julian writes, but yet oftentimes our trust is not full, for we're not secure that God hears us, and we think it's because of our unworthiness and because we feel nothing at all, for we are as barren and as dry oftentimes after our prayers as we were before. And so in our feeling, our folly is the cause of our weakness. For thus have I felt in myself. Oh, what insight this passage offers into Julian's own contemplative prayer. We can easily identify with her feeling of not being heard, feeling unworthy, not feeling anything at all, and not being able to stay alert and aware. She struggled just as we do. And then she writes, and all this our Lord brought suddenly to my mind and showed these words and said, I am the ground of thy beseeching. First it is my will that thou have it. And next I make thee to will it. And next I make thee to beseech it. And thou beseechest it. How should it then be? that thou shouldst not have thy beseeching? Isn't that the perfect understanding of prayer? The desire to pray for anything or anyone or for the state of the world doesn't come from us. It comes from Christ himself. He is the foundation and the prime mover of all our prayer and our meditation practice. First in his goodness, he wills to give us some grace. Then he makes us desire it. Next, he inspires us to beseech it with all our heart. And then we actually do beseech it fervently in prayer. So how could it be that we would not receive what we were beseeching so earnestly since it was Christ's will that we have it in the first place? In essence, this revelation about the true orientation of all types of prayer turns around the old view of praying to God 180 degrees. Christ is not out there, and I'm in here praying for some much needed help or grace, or even seeking to be still and focused in time of meditation. Christ is the very ground our being within from which every desire to pray arises. And then we see that true prayer is not ever initiated by us. It's inspired by God. And, and prayer is never meant to convince God to give us what we need. That would be foolish. On the contrary, this means that Prayer is the means by which we are able to receive the graces God longs to give us. Christ is the source and goal of all true prayer. He makes our prayer effective by inspiring in us what to pray for. And it is Christ's Holy Spirit who is actually moving us from our heart, from our pain, from our joy, from our fear to pray for what we need and long for from his heart. And then he sends graces out to us and through us to the whole world. Julian said that she felt a mighty comfort in being sure that the Lord himself is the ground of all prayer. She says, for it is the most impossible that may be that we should seek mercy and grace 
and not have it. For every thing that our good Lord makes us beseech, he himself has ordained it to us from the beginning. And Julian intuited that Christ receives every one of our prayers and safeguards it in a spiritual treasury that she says benefits us now on earth and will be a source of great joy in heaven. And most importantly for Julian, the whole point of prayer is that it wanteth the soul to God. Prayer enables us to desire only what God desires, even more than our own will. And Julian tells us that the Lord derives very great pleasure from an innocent soul that comes to him nakedly, plainly, and homely. That is, on the most intimate terms. And in those special moments, she says, when the Lord makes his presence known to the soul by a special grace, we have what we desire. And in times of such spiritual wanting, as she calls it, we find that all our needs and even our fears fall away. Our striving abates and the soul wishes only to rest in the stillness and the silence of simply beholding God. And Julian calls this high unperceivable prayer as to my sight. And when this, within this, this state of mystical prayer, beholding God without the need for words, Julian tells us that the soul, the soul enjoys reverent fear and such great sweetness and delight in him that we cannot pray at all except as he leads us to pray for the time. And she adds that the more the soul beholds God in this pure contemplative prayer, the more it desires him by grace. Yea, and he wills in all things that we have our beholding and our enjoying in love. And of this knowing, we are most blind for some of us believe that God is almighty and may do all, and that he is all wisdom and can do all, but that he is all love and will do all, there we balk. Here Julian zeroes in on the source of all our doubts about the effectiveness of prayer. In essence, she explains why we can't firmly believe that all shall be well, because we're not fully convinced of the love God has for each and every one of us or the lengths to which God will go to express it. We believe God is all powerful and may make all things well and that he is all wise and he can make all things well, but we are not absolutely secure, certain in our hearts that God is all love and that he will make all things well in the most perfect way possible. Something in us, our contrariousness, resists believing that God cares about us that much, that unconditionally, because we keep looking at ourselves. We keep looking at our faults, our sins, our bad habits, yet it's up to us to stop looking at ourselves and make a blind leap of faith that no matter how overwhelming our, our memories or our sorrow or our struggles or our sense of having failed may be in the present moment, God is still and always caring for us, holding us, enveloping us, in love. The Holy Spirit will never deal, leave us to deal with our, our struggles alone. And you know, unless we practice this, and we have to practice it at times, we may lose our capacity to hope. And we may forfeit our ability to truly love. Julian admits 
quite frankly, that because of our feebleness and the distraction of our passion, we often fall into spiritual heaviness and even despair. And still she insists that the mercy and the grace flowing from the Holy Spirit, if only we will open ourselves to it, make us able to rise to even greater joy. This is Julian's unwavering viewpoint. And it didn't come easily for her. Any more than it comes easily for us. Julian sees the only remedy for our failings, whatever they may be, as simply recognizing our wretchedness and fleeing to the Lord like a child, to its mother, our mother Christ. He's the only one who wants the best for us. And so what do we do in the practice of our contemplative prayer? We, we enter into the eye of the storm where there's perfect calm, where Christ is holding out his hand to support us on the troubled waters of our lives. And when we grasp that hand, we realize we'll be okay. And everyone we love will be okay. Because Christ himself calms the howling winds and all the turmoils in our mind so we can let go and we can surrender all our fear and our doubts and finally rest, oh, the rest we need so much in the divine heart as Julian did. Because ultimately, this practice of contemplative prayer resting in the heart of God is not something we do. It's something we become. So we begin to pray always. And as this total conversion of mind and heart starts to happen through our contemplative prayer practice, we begin to perceive who we truly are and who we truly are not. We're not the sum total of our failure or our sins. We're God's beloved children. And Julian also realized, and this is important, that because of the inseparable union made between divinity and humanity in the incarnation of Christ. The ground of our own being is forever enclosed in the ground of Christ's own being. The infinite ground of Christ's awareness permeates our own awareness, our awareness, our ability to be aware is not separate from Christ's awareness, Christ's ground, his father, our father. And since Christ is the ground of our being and the ground of all our beseeching, then whenever prayer arises in our hearts, that all shall be well in our lives and the lives of those we love and throughout the world, we realize we are praying Christ's own prayer. And that, that is how through our contemplative practice, we begin to see that everything is being made well in the ultimate sense. And this attitude becomes the rock solid foundation and, and the cause of our peace and our joy, no matter the circumstances of our lives. And we begin to believe that we are so knitted and wanted, as Julian says, to God forever, that we are already enfolded in Christ's mystical body. And that Christ truly pray, prays his most urgent, love-longing prayer within us. 
And so when we sit down in silence and stillness without words to behold God's love, we simply rest in the embrace of the creator, our divine lover, who is the source and wellspring of our very being. And we drop into the fertile ground of our being, just as Julian did in the anchorage. And we become aware of our own ability to be aware. And that flows directly through us from divine awareness. And we see that there's only awareness and those appearances that rise up in our mind, in front of our closed eyes, as it were. But we pay no attention to the appearances. We choose to rest in this stillness of pure awareness. The awareness of simply being aware. And there we find peace. And we discover the joy of absolute certainty that we are loved. Julian comments, therefore it is that there may nor shall be truly nothing at all between God and the human soul. And this unitive prayer that knits and, and wanteth the soul to God is prayer at its most radical and therefore most transformative. And as we become knitted and wanted to God through this silent prayer of beholding God, we gain deeper insight into how Christ is making all things well in the divine dimension, which is the only true dimension, the only one that matters. And once we begin to experience this peace, this dropping, this letting go, there comes a joy that no one can ever take away from us. It's profound. It's Christ's own joy. And that is how we begin to live more hope-filled, joy-filled, resurrected lives. By allowing God to love us. Day after day, year after year. And we, we suddenly acknowledge that yes, we are God's dearly beloved sons and daughters. And we hear in the silence, as Julian herself did, Christ say to us, I love thee, and thou lovest me, and our love shall never be separated in two. And Julian realizes that God never began to love humankind. God always loved human beings from without beginning, for we poured out of the creator, God's own children. Julian writes, for just as mankind will be in endless bliss, fulfilling the joy of God with respect to his works, just so has that same mankind in the foresight of God been known and loved from without beginning in his righteous intent. Thus, Julian became quite convinced that all shall be well in the end because all was well in the beginning when the Trinity fashioned the human soul in the image and likeness of itself. And she saw that the making of the soul is so perfect that through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, it will be brought up to a greater perfection even than its first creation. So Julian urges us, of all the things that we are obliged to do in this life, we must give God the greatest pleasure by rejoicing in this joy. And notwithstanding all our feeling, woe, or weal, God wills we understand and believe that we are more truly in heaven than on earth. What an astounding statement. Julian is challenging us to live resurrected lives even now as if we were already in heaven, even in the midst of all our woe. 
She is certain because Christ has already saved us and incorporated us into his mystical body. <clears throat> our true lives are not here in our mortal bodies, but in the joyful embrace of the Trinity. And finally, in the 16th revelation, Julian experienced the profound presence of Christ dwelling in her soul. She writes, the place that Jesus takes in our soul, he shall never leave it without end. For in us is his homeliest home and his endless dwelling. And this was a delectable sight and a restful showing that is without end. And the beholding of this while we're here, it is very pleasant to God and a very great benefit to us. And the soul that thus beholds makes itself like to him that is beheld and unites with it in rest and in peace by his grace. And this was a singular joy and bliss to me that I saw him sit for the secareness of sitting showed endless dwelling. Julian drew comfort from the fact that this vision of Christ was of Christ dwelling in the center of her soul and sitting, not going anywhere. And she wants us to take comfort in this same beholding. And she wants us to be still and know that I am God, as the psalmist says. And she wants us to stop rushing and simply allow God to love us. So how are we to make all these glorious words of Julian, Christ to Julian, resonate throughout our lives? How are we to live resurrected lives as Julian urges us to live when we're still so embroiled in the joys and the sorrows and the challenges and the crises of our present world. I believe that if we have faith that Christ's death on the cross conquered death, not only his death, but ours as well, and if we believe that he rose to new life for us, then we can trust with St. Paul that whoever truly dies with him a little every day will also rise with him. And if we believe that Christ is the ground of our being and that he himself is the inspiration for all our beseeching that all shall be well, then we will be inspired to commit our whole life to a process of radical transformation of mind and heart, no matter what it requires of us. Those words, all shall be well, as I said, are not a feel-good panacea for what ails us, but a clarion call to be transformed. It's a call to put on the mind of Christ and begin to view and to trust everything that happens in our lives from this divine dimension, no less. And it demands that every single day we do prepare for our future life. It's what we were created for. And what we were redeemed for at such a great price. Paul urges us to realize that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. So Paul directly links this newness of life, this foretaste of our resurrection, to the living reality of Christ's resurrection. And this is what Paul wanted for us. But we don't have to wait until death to experience this newness of life. With Julian's guidance, with the riches, richness of the sacraments, we, we can and we must do it every day. And so when we go into the ground of our being, in the silence of awareness, we become aware of this presence sitting in our souls. 
just like Julian did. And we behold God as she did. And we gain a resurrection perspective that allows us to move back from all the thoughts and the emotions that, that can thwart our faith and crush our hopes. And we drop into a state of absolute trust that God is making all things well. It's a choice. And we realize that, in fact, all shall be well is a resurrection mantra. The saving power of Christ's death and resurrection cannot fail. Of that we can be sure. And the more we personally enter into and believe in the divine ground within our soul, the more, as I've said, we'll become privileged to see how all shall be well, both in our current lives and in the ultimate sense. And then the more we begin to live resurrected lives here and now. Now, does this mean giving up focus on our work, striving to realize our very human dreams and ambitions? Of course not. While we're on this earth, we must be fully committed to creating and exploring and experiencing every aspect of our God-given life. We must be the first to transform this earth, dedicated to the human effort and bringing some measure of God's kingdom of justice and peace and mercy and love to our world in our lifetime. And we must be totally involved in nurturing and supporting one another because no one lives or dies or is saved alone. The fact is that by seeking to live resurrected lives in Christ, more and more deeply through the celebration of Eucharist and, and our daily practice of contemplative prayer, we become able to bring greater compassion and determination to the full range of all our earthly commitments. We become wiser, more centered, more balanced, more hopeful in handling all the ups and downs and the tragedies of our existence. And we grow more accustomed to seeing everything that's happened in our life in the past and that's happening now. And that does not happen from a divine perspective. And we can help other people see it from that perspective, too, if our faith is strong enough. Indeed, the whole creation is being renewed, breath by breath, moment by moment, and transformed by the ongoing power of Christ's resurrection. And that is the core of Christ's promise that all shall be well. Faith in this fact is the foundation for living resurrected lives. Now, I would like to take any questions or comments you might have, and then I will finish with a few final words. If anyone wants to ask a question, uh, just raise your hand or make a comment. I, I can see some here, but not all. Um, not quite sure how this will work. There's a raised hand. Um, oh, oh, I see. Yes. Thank you. I will ask you to unmute, please. Would you unmute? Annunciata? Uh, 
not quite sure. I'm sorry, I did not have a question. I just was wanted to say thank you so very, very much. Oh, all right. Thank you. And, and, and uh, no. to, ah. I would like to ask whether there's a recording of this, of your words you've mentioned to us for the last hour and a half because they were so precious. I would like to hear them again. Well, I understand that a recording is being made now and will be up on the Friends of Julian website for all of those who were unable to um, attend today. So yes, you will be able to hear it again. On the Julian website? No, on the Friends of Julian website. Friends of Julian. Of Julian website, the sponsors of, of these talks. Right. And if I could just elaborate on that, I'm going to write to everybody who is signed up to this through Eventbrite in the next couple of days with uh, the link directly for you. Uh, there's someone here too, but I can't. So I can see that Father Richard has his hand up. Father yes, Richard. I'm... Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Uh, thank you, Veronica, for such an amazing and theological tour de force uh, delivered with such um, enthusiasm and conviction and passion. It was really inspiring. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, and I love the way that you um, don't just treat Julian as if she sort of stands alone and pops into existence in the middle of nowhere, but you absolutely <laughs> root her in the scriptures and in the life of the church and in the mystical tradition and in our own experience of prayer as Christians. So thank you very much for that. Um, one of the things that um, we experience here, certainly at St. Julian's Church, and I know that you will experience in your own um, ministry of writing and teaching, uh, is the number of people who uh, speak of themselves as identifying with Julian's writings and her teaching and her spirituality, um, but who don't uh, confess themselves as Christians, either in a nominal sense or in any sense at all. Um, and certainly in the city of Norwich, which um, is uh, statistically uh, the city with the um, highest proportion of atheists and agnostics um, in the United Kingdom, according to the census, um, uh, you know, we see Julian's words, all shall be well, um, all, all over the place on shop windows and tea towels and merchandise. Oh. And, all things. and one of the things that's good about the talk you're giving tonight is that you've given some theological content to that, which otherwise can just feel a bit like crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to you is, um, bearing in mind the perspectives of some of our brothers and sisters who come to us but wouldn't think of themselves as Christians, can an atheist or an agnostic think that all shall be well? Wow, that is a profound question. Thank you. <laughs> Let me see you. Let me see if Julian can help me answer it. Atheist, agnostic, non-Christian, Buddhist, whatever. I think the place Julian would take, would suggest to that person, is to go into the ground of their own being. their own awareness, their ability to be aware of anything and everything coming forth, being created in their minds, flowing out, to sit and behold whether a person believes in, quote, God or Buddha or a kind of universal unity or love, that can be I almost want to say distilled into the experience that Julian calls us to of this simple awareness and in the stillness of that awareness, I believe God 
reveals the person to himself, herself. Because if God is the ground, as we believe, of all being, then for a person to simply make the choice to sit and be still in contemplative prayer or meditation is the beginning of awareness of being more than the self. You can't miss it. When people of different faiths, and I have led many, many, many meditation groups over the years, some of little, some of lot faith, all different faiths, all confused faiths, everyone has a different idea of God. But when people come together in contemplative prayer and they practice twice a day, the ground of their being becomes, shall we say, fertilized, and they start to grow. And they become rooted in that ground. And they may not know that God is the ground, but they know something's happening. And they know something is changing. And they know they're questioning in a different way. And as they start to grow and get stronger and stronger and the branches and the leaves and the fruit appear, the day may come, they will say, is this not God I believe in? But it must begin with communal prayer. I believe that is so much more powerful than argument. Yes, explaining the faith, we do that all the time. Terribly important that it be done well. But the communal practice will draw people in almost in spite of themselves. There's something so attractive about a group of people sitting in community in contemplative prayer, knowing that they also have a private practice at home. That commitment is fascinating to people. Why do they do it? What do they do? What do they experience? I want that. And it isn't just about, you know, feeling a little better, a little less stressed. Meditation is about going into the ground. It's about naughting oneself, as Julian would say, dropping everything, letting go everything, everything we think we are and think we're not, and all those separate selves that are not who we are. And naughting all of those in order to allow the divine reality to spring forth in us. And it's not as if God is shy. If a person opens just a crack, the soul just a crack, light floods in. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, I often think it's almost like um, Julian's kind of, if you allow Julian to induct us into that, she, she reminds me sometimes of, um, particularly when talking to people who aren't, um, you know, identifying as Christians, um, of that, that scene in the Acts of the Apostles where St. Paul is preaching um, in Athens and he says, you know, I've been around the city and I've seen all the altars to all your gods. And I saw an altar that said to an unknown God, and what you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you. Hmm. But we do have to allow people to time to grow, yeah. to put down roots in the ground. But what we have to teach the most, or what we have to offer the most, I think, is the practice is the listening, is the becoming aware of who, who, who they are. Because inevitably, as the false self 
falls away, the created self by God will arise and they will be able to resist it. Thank you. Christine, your hand is up. Please do unmute. Actually, it's me. It's Ian. Um, thank you so much for that. I was. I wanted to ask you about contemplative prayer. You've mentioned it on several occasions. Does Does Julian have a teaching on contemplative prayer? We uh, together follow a centering prayer practice. Mm -hmm. um, I was just interested in in whether Julian had a particular teaching on contemplative prayer. Oh, that's the 14th revelation. You really must sit down with it and read it word by word and take everyone to heart because it is the most magnificent section on prayer that she felt she was, she admits she was taught by Christ uh, and she takes it from, and I go very deeply in, in Julian's gospel into this, um, from what I said were the two aspects of prayer into um, the prayer of thanksgiving, into the uh, how prayer must be be large, <laughs> not small, not piddling, but large, because Christ wants us to have large prayers. And she talks about um, uh, frustration in prayer. She talks about a whole prayer life. And then she moves on to mystical prayer. And then, as I just mentioned, in the 16th revelation, she goes into the mystical life uh, where she sees Christ sitting in her soul. So if you take the the the, the arc from the 14th revelation on uh, to the 16th, you see uh, not that she gave a a step by step mystical path, but it's inescapable from the early uh, mention in her in her revelations of as I said, knotting herself and um, the need to be stripped to be purified. That is the path of purification, and then the path of illumination i'm sorry about that the path of illumination comes later and um she she gives you she gives you the flow of it she gives you the um the sense that uh it's an ongoing process it's it's not something that we ever get to because as i said prayer is not something you do or you accomplish it's what you become and that our whole lives be prayer, uh, whether we're peeling carrots or changing diapers or gardening or writing books. Um, it's all one prayer because the inspiration for everything we do is coming from the ground of our being. And as such, uh, when you pull it all together in Julian's writings, um it is all one prayer really and i will pray her prayer at the end very shortly and by the way centering prayer um i just been giving a series of, of talks uh for these um, COSA of South, uh, South Africa, contemplative outreach of South Africa uh, over this year on Julian. And I've given centering prayer retreats. And uh, oh yes, I'm, I'm very much into that um, mode of contemplative prayer. Thank you. Anyone else? Well then, let me just say a few final words here. Um, I think it's a good reminder because at the near the end of her revelations, Julian was reflecting on all these words that Christ had told her. And she's very clear. She writes, he did not say, thou shalt not be tormented. Thou shalt not be wearied. Thou shalt not be distressed. But he said, thou shalt not be overcome. God wills that we take heed of this word and that we be ever mighty in secure trust, in weal and woe, for he loves us and delights in us. And so he wills that we love him and take delight in him 
and mightily trust in him, and all shall be well. So at the very last 68th chapter, there are 86, but it's still toward the end of the revelations. Julian clarifies that all the revelations of God's love and mercy and grace and, and, and protection cannot prevent us from suffering the effects of our misdeeds because of sin and because of bad habits and imperfections. And the showings, these beautiful revelations won't stop disappointment or illness or failure or aging or untimely deaths. These are the common lot of humanity. And the revelations won't guarantee that our spiritual lives will go along smoothly and that our relationships will be without conflict and that everything that we work so hard for will be accomplished in this life. Nor are those words of Christ meant to belittle or pass over or, you know, fling off the depths of our own private agonies. No, Christ respects those. But those words are meant to reassure us that no matter how tormented or exhausted or desperate we become at times, we will not be overcome by the darkness of evil. And when we look at our world, it takes a lot of faith to believe this. But God wants us to rely on his loving care in good times and bad, in success and failure and joy and sorrow. Christ loves us simply because he loves us, not because what we, we do or we fail to do. Julian so beautifully says again and again that God likes being in our lives. He loves us and delights us. And he enjoys dwelling in our souls as his homeliest home. And God wants nothing more than that we really, 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 really like him in return and always trust him. And if we do, all shall be well, even though we can't imagine how, because the entire story of our salvation is one of divine love. Divine love holds everything in being, and it's the meaning why anything continues to exist at all. And divine love is the one and only reason why we can actually be confident that all shall be well. And over the course of years and, and struggles, Julian struggled in the anchorage. One point she called it a prison. It was not always filled with light. But over the years, she finally found the secureness she'd sought all her life in this divine love. Divine love became the answer to all her questions. And Julian's revelations are finally a gospel of love. They testify that we're created by love, out of love, and for love. And she writes, for our soul is so preciously loved by him that is highest, that it overpasses the knowing of all creatures. That is to say, there is no creature that is made that may know how much and how sweetly and how tenderly our maker loves us. And therefore, we may ask of our divine lover with reverence all that we will. And Julian finishes her revelations as she began them with a reflection on the all-enclosing trinity of love. Love is the ground and the meaning of our creation, our redemption, and our ultimate enclosure in God's glory. She bears witness to the creator who formed us out of love, the savior whose works of love make all things profitable to us, and the spirit whose love will bring us home into eternal life. And just as she said we've been loved since without beginning, so Julian affirms that 
The revelations were shown to her for the sake of love, that all might be brought to fruition. And she has borne witness again and again that the heart of Christ thirsts for every soul, as if it were the only soul ever created. And Christ has no, no greater love longing and no greater thirst than to enclose us into his own mystical body within the Trinity. And Julian assures us that as we behold this marvelous wonder of God's intimate love, dwelling and working and tendering the garden in the ground of our very soul, we shall experience our lives as a whole new creation. And when this salvific work is finally completed within us and within every single soul, then indeed all shall be well. And thou shalt see thyself that all matter of thing shall be well. This is Christ's promise and Julian's. And I'd like to close with Julian's own prayer. God of thy goodness, give me thyself. For thou art enough to me. And I may ask nothing that is less that may be full worship to thee. And if I ask anything that is less, ever will I be wanting. But only in thee do I have all. I just want to say that uh, if you would like information about my two books on Julian, that Howard mentioned Julian's Gospel and uh, an explorer's guide to Julian of Norwich, you may visit my website, veronicamaryrolf.com, and just scroll down the home page, mm -hmm. and you'll find on that website two uh, links to the 25 Life, Love, and Light podcasts that I did on Julian uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, which have now about 32,000 downloads <laughs> around the world. Amazing. Uh, and they include guided meditations <clears throat> at the end of every episode, which may help you with Julian's revelations. And there are also podcast seasons, as Howard said, on the biblical mystics and the stages of the mystical path and on living resurrected lives. And you will find on my website information about my most recent book, which was in fact co-authored by my daughter, who is a full-time contemplative, Eva Natanya. Uh, and our book is entitled Living Resurrected Lives. And it was inspired by Julian's revelations, of course. And I invite you to join us on Facebook. I write blogs and uh, there are a lot of beautiful people uh on that facebook page it's it's a very different facebook page from others you might find yeah. so i just want to finish and ask a blessing for this very special anniversary year may julian fill you with her own presence her gentleness her warmth her joy her courage and her wisdom and I pray that she will help us all experience the joy of contemplative prayer so that it becomes for us the one thing necessary in our lives. And may she reassure you every single day that because God loves you, all shall be well. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings to all. Thank you.
Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. God bless you. And thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so very much. God bless you. Thank you.